well, I'll go, I'll go vocal then. The, um, well, this is, um, what we've got is presentation. All the, all the pictures were taken by Ken recently, and they're very good. I'm very impressed by them. But they're of some of the wildflowers that you can find at the moment and should be able to find for the rest of this month in Scrapyard Meadow and Cantrell Road. And, and many of them can be found elsewhere in the park as well. Now, the, um, there's a lot I haven't, I haven't mentioned, a lot of flowers I've not, not that, that are there that I just haven't got time to talk about. So when, when, we, uh, when, when we have discussion questions afterwards, if, if you have got a burning question about any other plant, please, uh, please uh, ask it. Now this one, this first one is perennial wall rocket. It, it's a plant in the cabbage family, which those of you who are expert botanists, I'm sure, We'll, we'll recognize the four petals which signify that family. Now, we've got a lot of this plant in the park and those, those yellow flowers are wonderful. They have a wonderful scent and they're, they're visited a lot. Bumblebees love them. And what, what is quite amusing um, is that very often a bumblebee will land on the flower and because the stem is, is quite flexible, the stem will bend right over to the almost to the ground with the weight of the bumblebee, and when the bumblebee gets off, up it'll spring again. So, and this this one is also a lot of people are very very keen on this as an edible wild plant. It's a rocket type flavour, but it's stronger than the rocket that you'll buy in the greengrocers. So we've got plenty of it. I think it's a plant that. Uh, I don't think we mind anybody trying the leaves of the rocket. Um, so that's number one, and we'll move on to the next one. Right, move on to, we've got three plants now from a different plant family, from, from, the, from, the pea, from the pea family. Now, this is not one of the best known plants in the pea family. It's a plant called spiny rest harrow. Because it, it really is quite spiky. I don't think I don't think you can pick the spikes out very well on there, but they are there. And they really are quite sharp. I I love the colour of this. This particular sort of pink and sh shades of pink. Pink's a bit deeper when it's still in bud. But the um, pea family flowers are very characteristic, and they've got names for the. They've got five petals, and they've got names for them. The big one at the top is called the standard, and the two at the sides are called the wings. And what you can't see, there's two in between the wings which are joined together, and they're called the keel. So, um, so the, okay, this is a spiny rest harrow. So we'll move on to the next one. This is another plant in that same family it hasn't got quite the same structure but it, it's um it's a plant called lucerne and the flowers are really quite tiny you can't really pick out the details on that they're, they're quite tiny and they're in little little bunches um they but but they've really got the same structure as the spiny rest harrow when, when the flowers are finished they they turn it each flower turns into a little pod, which is a very strange shape. It, it, shape. it burn, bends around like a sickle. Um, that, that's quite an important plant for insects and in particular the caterpillars of the holly blue butterfly and the, and the common blue butterfly will feed on that. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's a plant with a huge history in human um, cultivation because it, it makes a very good fodder crop you can you can plant a field of lucerne and then you can cut it several times in the course of the summer provided it's getting plenty of water and you can feed that cut stuff to the animals so it, it's a high yielding it's a high yielding fodder crop and it's it used to be grown a lot in Britain it's not grown so much now not grown much at all but in other countries particularly in warmer ones it's still grown a great deal and it has been grown for many, many centuries as a fodder crop. So we'll move on. 
to the next picture. Ah, here we are. This is really one of our prize, you know, wildflowers. It, it's um, it, it's very obviously a pea, with very big flowers. It's um, called everlasting sweet pea because basically it comes back year after year. E each autumn, like most of these flowers, it dies right down. And then in the spring, it grows again. It, 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 there, there are quite large patches of it. There are several of them in Scrapyard Meadow. They, they, um, they, oh, I lost my thread for a second. Anyway, there, there, are, there are several large patches. And one, when you pass one, one thing to look for is to see if there's a brimstone butterfly on there or more than one. Because for, for whatever reason, this is the absolute favorite nectar plant of brimstone butterflies. And they'll, they'll search it out and they'll often stay there all day, just occasionally rising up and flying around. Um, so that's, that's the everlasting pea. And we'll move on to the next one. Right, we're, mo we're moving, this is a different, this is a plant in a different family. But this, this plant is in the pink, and campion family. Um, pink, pink plants in that family have five petals and you, you, you can count them there. Um, Ken's got two pictures because, basically because it does vary in color. Um, it can be from white as on the left, through to that typical pinkish color, through to much stronger pink, almost red sometimes. And, when when you see it, you often see a big patch of it because it's one of the it's a plant that creeps by its rootstock and the, the patches get bigger every year. The the, um, the the flower is a kind of well, it's it's a tubular flower, and one of the things you might see on it this summer is is there's a there's a day flying moth that some people will know called the hummingbird hawk moth, which is quite amazing because it really you, you, people really see it and they think gosh I've seen I've seen a tiny hummingbird because that's the way it behaves what it what it can do when it finds a patch of soapwood or any other flower with a tube is is to hover in front and get the nectar out and go from go from one flower to the next almost in a, in a split second um, so that you will see you will see a few I, I've seen five hummingbird hawk moths so far this summer. I don't think I saw any last year. So uh, if you keep your eyes out, you might see one. And this is one of the places you might see them. And I think we, uh, we'll see another flower later where you might also see it. We'll move on to the next one. Right. This, this, this flower is called agrimony. And you you wouldn't guess by looking at it that it, that it belongs to the rose family. Um, ro ro the rose family not only has rose bushes of one kind and another, it also has fruits like strawberry, apple, plum, pear, and some much smaller plants like this one. So it, its flowers are on a spike. The, Plants we've seen previously have not been on spikes, but quite a lot of plants are. Now, the picture on the right, you've, you've got to look quite closely because when, when the agrimony finishes flower, e each flower develops into just one very large seed. Um, I think you can see these green blobs on the side of the stalk and they're hooked. So it's, it's one of the plants that if you, you or your dog goes for a walk in the park. It's one of quite a number of plants that can uh, catch on to you and have you transporting their seed. I wondered what the little funny little shape in the middle of the stem was, and Ken tells me it's a garden spider. So we'll move on to the next one. Right. This is a plant called Perforate St. John's Wort belongs to a little family all on its own, the St. John's Wort family or Hypericum family. Um, it, all the plants that we have in this country have 
have yellow flowers like this. But some are smaller, some are bigger. Some of the plants are smaller, some of the plants are bigger. Some of them are bushes. Um, the the uh, so we've got the the five we've got the five petal flower. And if you take the le but the name part of the first part of the name comes from the leaves. If if you take a stem with some leaves on and you hold the leaf up to the light and you look from underneath what you'll see is it appears to have hundreds of tiny holes in the leaf but that that's why perforate but they're not actually holes they're apparently they're they're little transparent windows which i i read are they're not empty but they're actually filled with oil um this one this plant here um Right, the name St John's Wort comes from the fact that it comes into flower round about St John's Day, which is June the 24th. Usually comes out a little bit before that. Um, it, um, if you were to go over, if you were to go to, to uh, overseas, if you were to go to somebody in Oregon, in Western United States, or you, you were to go to somebody in Victoria, in Australia, and mention this plant, they might well look at you in horror because uh, in those in those places this plant is i read seriously invasive it's not seriously invasive here um quite a lot of plants are in that category so anyway that's perforate st john's wort so we'll move on to the next one of ken's lovely pictures now here's a here here are two closely related plants stuck side by side um as as with the St John's Wort family, all, all the plants in this family that we have in this country, they show their family resemblance quite clearly. But here are two of them: hedge bed straw and ladies' bed straw. When you you can when you look at them more closely, what what you they have, they have kind of rings of quite tiny leaves around the round the flower stalks. They don't show up. You can't sort those out very easily on the picture um, but you can see on the ladies bed straw you can see the rings and they're, they're much uh, each leaf is very very slender on the ladies bed straw where it's a bit thicker on the hedge bed straw now the, these um these these are an example where plants have very very tiny individual flowers but they cluster them together to, to make something that an insect can land on to pollinate them the, the uh, one of the, I mentioned a little while ago, I mentioned the hummingbird hawk moth. Now, one I did actually see um, with um, Anthony from the Towling Estate. I was showing, looking at some plantings where he lives and uh, I saw this, this thing come in and it was actually a hummingbird hawk moth female and she had spotted or smelt or somehow detected a patch of hedge bed straw. And she made for it and uh, turned her back to it and put her tail down on a leaflet and laid an egg and then did flew up and did the same again. So you, you might either see a hummingbird hawk moth of either sex nectaring at a flower, or you might see a female over over a patch of bed straw laying her eggs. So we'll move on to the next one. The, this one we need to look at. Ken told me he had quite a bit of a job photographing this, but it, he had. This is a wild carrot. He has he has captured sort of all the essential features. If you if you if you look closely, first of all, if you look down, you you can see that the you can see the the carrot like leaves because this this plant is the direct direct ancestor of our garden carrots. Although if you dig it up, you'll find a tough, a small tough white root, which does smell like a carrot, but is too, you know, too tough to eat really. But the carrots have been developed from this. Um, you, you can see there's another plant where you have tiny, tiny individual flowers, but they're all collected together. And in this case, they're collected together in a kind of plate. Um, so insects can, very readily get on there and move around what you what you can see on the bottom flower particularly is that 
usually, but well, not always, really, not always, um, a wild carrot plant with its heads of flowers. They'll all be white except for one flower right in the middle, which will be sort of reddish or a kind of dark purple like this one. I think you can, you can see that, that, that flower. Why on earth that should be and how it came about, don't ask me. Um, if you look between the three flowers, halfway up the stem of the, uh, of, of, of the tallest one, I think you can see the, um, I think that looks like a, that, that is, a, after the flower's finished, it's the seed head developing. The, the seed head does a very strange thing. Um, the, the, the stalks of the outside flowers grow more than the stalks of the inside flowers. So the whole thing bunches up like that, which seems, you know, rather odd. But um, I think when it when it when it when it's really ripe, it does tend to open out again, and um, uh, and you get the individual seeds in there, which are covered with little they're covered with little hooks, so they they can travel around if they catch on to anything. Um, so that that wild carrot won't be there next year because like. Some of the other flowers, I don't know. Yeah, well, that might be the first one so far. But that that plant is a biennial, so it's one of these plants that takes two years to grow, and then flowers and seeds and dies. So wild carrot. Next one, please. Okay. Right. This this is a a plant in the mint family. To which you get mints and rosemaries and lavenders and sages, um, and it's it's marjoram. It it has lots and lots and lots of actually quite tiny flowers, as you can see, and they're not all open. They're not all open at the same time. The the sepals that are around them are, are that deep purple colour. So that's what you can see there. So this is very aromatic plant. It's sort of green all the year round. Um, and it's a, it's an absolute magnet for, uh, it's a bit of a magnet for butterflies when you, when you see that. Again, it, it's got the same principle of lots of tiny flowers, but all grouped together so an insect can stand on the whole lot and then feed from one after another. Um, it's not quite the same as the oregano that you often grow in gardens that that's very closely related but um but you can use wild marjoram as a herb very happily so um what you will find if you look in the if you're looking for marjoram this very dry weather is is sort of adversely affecting quite a lot of the flowers and some of the marjorams are not putting on a very good show because they're getting too dry and the flowers are failing so Ken found it, but you will find some good ones. Um, I think we can move on to the next one. Right, we've got, again, we've got two closely related flowers here. The two, two kinds of scabious, field scabious and small scabious. Um, we've got a lot of the first one, the field scabious, and we've got some, but not not nothing like the quantity of, of the other one, the small scabious. The the, um, the these flowers are unusual. They're, they're in a little family, which also includes teasels. And um, what's un, what's unusual about them is that they're compound flowers. That one of those flower heads is actually not one flower. It's lots and lots of flowers sharing some common parts and um that that's that's the case with all the flowers in the daisy family but it's also the case in in this family um the uh, right so we've we've got the we've got the two of them there that the field and the small now if you look when the field when the field scabious flower is finished you see those green those round green things that they're the seed heads and they produce, you know, quite a lot of quite large seeds. And um, in fact, if goldfinches, if goldfinches find those, they'll gobble them all up. But um, the, uh, 
if you look across for a moment at the small scabious, you can see the flowers aren't, they're not really quite the same, they're similar, but they're not quite the same. But the seed heads are quite different, that they sort of, perhaps it's hard to tell with those details, they're a different shape for a part. For, but, well, for a start, they're a different shape. And you can also kind of see, you can pick out the individual seeds kind of arranged in sort of rows around the, uh, around the flower head. Um, one of the things about scabious flowers is that it both the seeds ripen very, very quickly. Um, when a week after they finish flowering, the seeds will be ripe, and, and and as soon as they're ripe, they'll they'll fall off the plant very, very readily, just at a touch. And I wondered whether, because they're such a good, they're, they're quite a large seed, which will help the plant to get a start in life if the seed gets onto the ground but maybe they they ripen and get get and detach themselves so very quickly so that they're not all eaten by birds um that's just my that's my hypothesis i don't really know whether it would be regarded as correct in any way so we can move on to the next picture we've got the first two pictures there are of the greater knapweed and, and the, the other one is of the black knapweed or lesser knapweed. The, these plants are quite closely related. Um, if we look, the leaves are different. I think you can tell that, that the, the leaves of the greater knapweed are very quite finely cut and the leaves of the black knapweed are, are cut, but not to the same extent. Um, if you've got the flower, um, if you look to the left hand picture, you've got one flower that's finished and what, what happens when it finishes is that the, the colour gradually drains out of all the floral, of all, all the parts of the flower. It's not quite drained all out there, but it doesn't take long. <coughs> it takes about a week. And what you're left with then is that other, with this very peculiar sort of flower head with lots of <coughs> this fluffy white dust, fluffy white sort of uh, threads on top. I don't know what their function can be unless it is actually, unless they even work to, to put off birds because they got to cope with that to get at the seeds. I don't really know. But, but again, they ripen in about a week. And once they're ripe, you just touch them and everything falls out, seeds and everything. And if you're at the park at the there's a lot there's quite a lot of greater knapweed, particularly along Cantrell Road. Um, and you'll see that what's left when everything has fallen out is a wonderfully silvery, shiny kind of base where, where the flower was. Um, so that's the greater knapweed. And on the other side, the black knapweed, quite similar. Sometimes the black nap, quite often the black knapweed has kind of rays sticking out the side, which this, this plant doesn't particularly. Um, and they're, they're, they're again, quite spectacular. In, insects love both of these flowers. They're very, very good. And um, black knapweed, one of the things about black knapweed is that sometimes you'll see it in amenity grass, which has not been cut for a while, because basically, it has the virtue of being able, you can mow it indefinitely and you don't kill it. It won't flower unless you give it a chance, but it won't be killed by the mowing like, like, like quite a lot of other flowers. Um, I think the, the plants are called knapweeds because apparently nap, the nap means that, that it means a head, like a, like, a, like a knob in that sense. It's related to that word. So because they both have got these very obvious heads and when, before the flowers open, they're, they're quite hard and firm, those heads. So black knapweed is often called hard heads. So we'll move on to the next one. This is, um, this is quite a tall plant. So Ken really didn't, couldn't get the whole height of the, of the plant in, in, in one picture, but it's, um, Dark mullein, there are other kinds of mullein and that there's um, 
great mullein or Aaron's rod is the best is the best known one, a very tall plant with a paler yellow flower. Um, what what you can't see is that what what's there is several spikes. The dark mullein flowers are on a spike like the agrimony. Um, and what's curious is that that purple that you see in the middle, you think, where does that purple come from? And that purple comes from the fact that the, the, the anthers, the male organs of the plant with the stamens on top, the anthers are densely hairy with these purple hairs, which is, you know, it just helps to make, you know, it helps to make the pattern of the flower. Um, so the, the, the dark mullein is another, is another biennial, so those plants won't be there next year, but others will have taken their place and they'll have their, they'll have their descendants in two years time. So we'll move on. I think I'm, aha. Now, th this is a plant that again, a plant called vervain, it, it's a, uh, it's our only native member of the verbena family. Gard gardeners will know various kinds of garden verbenas. And it's um, difficult. What, what Ken has done is got a picture that focuses on, on the, focuses on the open flowers, which is sometimes that whitish color. And I think actually you can see on the other picture, they look, they look purplish. They really are more purplish than whitish, but they're much, be a trick of the light and trick of the camera but this is actually quite a large plant probably about the size of a an oversized football or a pumpkin that that kind of shape with lots and lots of stems and but what they do you can see that the stems are really very long and they they open when the plant first begins to flower in the summer the, the, the flowers at the bottom of the spike open first then the following day they open a bit, bit further up and they keep going up and up and up and and this one is getting quite close to the top um but above the top but the thing is that isn't really the top because what will happen is that that short segment which is above the flowers will 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 lengthen the stem will lengthen so it'll grow out for quite a lot and probably flower for another couple of months and be maybe when it finishes be be twice as long as it is now. So um, that's Burbane. It did once have a strong medicinal reputation, but I don't think it does have any more. Um, next one. Right now, we're going into we're, we're going into the scrapyard meadow pond at the moment for this. The, uh, it, at the, presently, it's, it's just ceased to be a pond for the time being because it's dried up and we don't have a water supply to, to fill it, I'm afraid. But the water, the water forget-me-not will survive that. Um, the, there are quite a few different kinds of forget-me-nots. Most of them grow on land, but a couple of them grow in water. Water forget-me-not grows only in the water and it can sort of grow in the mud at the side or it can grow right out in the middle of the pond um, and uh, tiny typical sort of forget-me-not flowers. Um, one, one of the things about forget-me-nots, long ago people didn't call them forget-me-nots, they called them scorpion grasses. You might think what they've got to do with scorpions or snakes, um, scorpions in this case, but what it, what it is, you can't really see that on this picture Plants in the, in their family, which is the sort of the borage family, they before they flower, that that their their sort of stem of flowers tends to be curled, and it, and it, it sort of um, you know only only straightens gradually as they open, and so people thought that that curled up flower stalk reminded them of a scorpion, um, so. What have we got there? Five petals, as so many flowers have, um, and so re related to plants like comfrey, borage, alkanet, and quite a few others. Vipers bugloss is a relative named after a snakes. Um, so I think we can move on to the next one.
and this is the last one i'm actually i've actually managed to keep more or less to the to the time i was recommended to try to keep to which is quite an accomplishment this, this plant is even more of a water plant than the and the forget-me-not it, it tends to go right out in the middle of the pond um and it, it will not grow well water forget me not won't grow on land either but this, this plant only grows in water um keeps its roots in the water but you can see the leaves you can see the simple kind of pointy leaves down below and um, what you've got what you have with this is a very elegant and architectural flower stalk as you can see you can see all those very slender side branches coming out um, and there the, the flowers only have three petals and one one thing that um i think ken noticed it first when we when they started coming out a few weeks ago um we noticed he noticed that they weren't out in the morning and in fact we've discovered that they don't they, the flowers don't open until sometime after 12 o'clock i think between 12 and 1 I've been meaning to try and stand by them and time the first one, but I haven't done that yet. The, the, uh, um, that, that's actually, you know, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite common for plants to only open for part of the, part of the day, and many of them close at night anyway, um, and some, some only open at night, but, but the times in which, the times that they open during the day are quite variable. The, the water plantain opens, say, sometime half past 12, one o'clock. Not quite sure when it closes, might try to watch that as well. Um, but there's a plant that some people will know, the, the goat's beard, which is, we're not showing you today, but it, it flowers earlier in the summer. Um, it's a kind of dandelion, and it opens at four in the morning and it closes at midday. So, uh, you know, i do not sure, you know, what the logic of not making yourself available to the insects all day long is but there must be some logic to it so i think that that's actually my my last one okay. excellent thank you very much terry that was fabulous so um yes yeah, so i don't know whether there's any questions left we need to pick up in the chat because i was recording so i couldn't see the chat um, so then, um, anything there, Susanna? There was one question from Marion. Uh, is knapweed related to scabious? Um, no, not not at all. Um, scabious is a member of the scabious and teasel family, and knapweed is a member of the daisy family. So, but they're not related beyond the fact that they're both flowering plants. Not related at all. I don't know, but they've got similarities. They've, they've developed, they've developed similar strategies really for survival and 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 uh, yeah, survival and success. I think that was. Uh, uh, there was one about lucerne. Is it native? Someone asked. I don't know whether it got answered in the chat. I, I'm not sure. I, I sort of so many of these plants. You know, not sure of whether they're native or not. I didn't. I. I brushed over that. I'm pretty sure it's it's not native. Um, I could be I could be wrong. But one one of the things to say about native plants, and I, I've been, um, it there's, there's been a lot of discovery in the last thirty years, and in fact, it's resulted in quite a lot of plants which had been definitely thought to be absolutely native, to be not so. The perennial war well. I think the perennial wall rocket has been known not to be native, but one of one of the surprises was that even vervain is thought not to be native. Um, many of these plants were were taken around the world in earlier times. Some of them taken deliberately. Vervain might have been taken deliberately as a medicinal plant. Um, nobody knows. It's so far back, um, and others came in as a result of um, human activities in fact one a good example is that all of what we think of corn the common cornfield annual wildflowers the, the poppy 
the corn the corn marigold the corn cockle the um, corn chamomile and the corn flower none of those are thought to be native they've all come in they came in with the first farmers who brought they didn't intend to bring the seed but the seed came with the crop seed so um so an awful lot of plants that we thought of as native are are now considered not to be native sometimes it's known when a plant was introduced to this country if it was introduced after after about 1600 there's a better much better idea but before that there really aren't you know there there aren't the written records of all you know there isn't the evidence but but means that i don't know i i haven't actually i've i've, I've got a book and i hope to read it sometime and find out how it was that they come they've come to some of their recent conclusions about what's native and what's not native um but one of one of the things i think i've said this in the previous talk is that native is native simply means not introduced not know, not knowingly or accidentally introduced by man arriving here by natural means not coming in on a ship or a plane or anywhere else and something that arrives on its own accord um, instantly becomes native so that um what was a good example of that it was a uh, oh yeah we've got a we've got a, the tree bumblebee didn't get to this country until about i think the early 2000s or the late 1990s but it's considered to have got here across the channel by itself and established itself so it's a native um right yeah, thanks terry In ingrid asked about because she missed the start whether they were all in flower and i can confirm they are because i took all the photos on friday yeah yeah <laughs> very good all in flower right now in the cemetery park but they um, are and i picked ones that should stay in flower for, for several more weeks you know <laughs> and there are quite a lot else in flower but i think there was enough on that and then um and eileen said i thought knapweed was a kind of thistle well it it sort of is and it it, it 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 the thing is a thistle is a kind of daisy and a sunflower is a kind of daisy a ragwort but they're all in that bigger family you know and all sorts but they don't all look you know you, you might not know it sometimes i mean a burdock is is in that family but they've got structural similarities and they've all got these compound flowers where what seems to be one flower is actually lots and lots of flowers sharing certain parts and you you netweeds a thistle like and in fact if you go to europe you'll get some very spiny netweeds seriously spiny um but our netweeds are not spiny even not all thistles are spiny but that they're, they're obviously not very far apart thistles and netweed are not very far apart in in relationship but one thing i meant to mention earlier that that's brought up Talking of compound flowers, if you take something like a clover, that's not a compound flower. It's a lot of flowers all together on one head. But if you look closely, they're all completely separate. They don't, they don't share. They've each got their own stalk and all their own parts. They don't share anything in the way that members of the daisy family or the scabious family do. That's me. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Jackie says, thank you, Terry. Lovely way to finish these talks. Very THCP-ish. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And then uh, Kevin's got... said he saw tall blue flowers across the cemetery park on Sunday. I imagine he's probably talking about the chicory. Would, um, would you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Chicory, I didn't, I didn't show chicory, part, partly because I couldn't show everything. Um, but the time to see the chicory again is in the morning you must see the chicory in the morning unless the day is very cool because the flowers come out at dawn and they depending on how hot the day is if the day is hot they'll be totally faded by 11 or 12 o'clock in the morning if the day is very cool and damp they may last until the evening but then they don't just close they, they actually they actually die well but they don't die in the sense that they they stop being a flower and they start becoming to be seeds then um and the, the extraordinary thing about chicory is that when the flowers come out you which is in june 
you you will see flowers on a chicory plant every single day probably right up to the middle of november because the, the plant synchron you know is amazingly synchronized to to spread its flowering time despite the fact that no one flower ever lasts more than a day it's quite extraordinary really and and they space themselves out all over the plant quite it's another of these uh, extraordinary things that plants do lovely and uh, citronella has said i believe st john's were are used for depression um, i mean i know you can go into health food shops and buy st john's yeah. supplements anything you want to say well i i don't claim to have any any knowledge or expertise on medicine of any kind over or otherwise i think that they they are um and i think you know that may well be efficacious you know i although i know that you know you 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 don't what what can happen you know if you take a herbal medicine it can still have problems interacting with tablets you might be taking from the doctor just as different tablets can have problems with one another but one one of the um yeah what was i going to say about about um about it um yeah one of one of the general things about herbal her, herbal medicine is that if you the active ingredients, the, the, the strengths of them in different plants may, may vary very considerably. So it's not like, to, if you take a tablet, you've got a standardized dose. And, and I think a lot, of, a lot of, there's been a lot of work on making herbal medicine mainstream by actually standardizing the doses and putting it in a tablet rather than just taking the plant. So when you, when you take the plant, I mean, if, if you take a plant like bird's foot trefoil, some of them have got a lot of, I think it's, um, what have they got? Some of them are seriously poisonous. Um, I've forgotten what the uh, actual poison is. And others don't have any of the poison. So, um, you know, plants are individuals. Unless, unless we as humans have bred them and standardised them, as we have with so many things, if they're wild plants, they're going to bear, they're individuals, and they're going to vary from one to another in everything, including their chemical composition. So I can't really, you know, that's, a, that's about all I know. I, I don't really know because I don't think I've ever taken anything with depression. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Um, Eileen yeah, wants the flowers, just... that, uh, the flowers I, just, I just look at the flowers themselves. Yes. Um, Eileen said, thanks, Terry. Missed some of the talk because Buddy was sick on the carpet. I'm pleased I heard most of it. Yeah, Buddy's been right, a bit yeah. unwell. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, sorry. sorry he was sick, Eileen. I hope he's all, all right, right now. Well, give, give, give my, uh, uh, give give my sympathy. Pass my sympathies to Buddy. Yep. Please. Um, Buddy's uh, a big dog, if not everybody knows. Yeah, nice, nice, nice greyhound. He's a lovely greyhound. Yeah. Very friendly. Um, he is. Big. And, and, and Siam has said, thanks. Really fascinating on the native plants. Ingrid has said, thanks, they are lovely photos. I really enjoyed the talk as I knew I would. Um, Sally said, thanks, Terry, can listen for hours. Ingrid's asked if it will be available. I can talk to watch. for hours too. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> uh, Ingrid's asked if it will be available to watch again. Yes, they will be. And we've started putting videos on our YouTube channel today. So there's the first five loading up as we speak. And we'll make a little bit of a noise about that and others will follow. Um, and... So, and Jim and Jenny, sure. I might put the, the link in now, Ken. Yeah, um, go for it. As we've all... put one in already. So I'll just yeah. put that in the chat in a second, guys. Yeah. And Jim and Jenny have said, excellent talk. Thank you, Terry. And yeah, said, lots, really of enjoyed this. What's in, lots of echoes and what's in, in, in the orchard. Yes. Um, yeah. Anna said, really enjoyed this. Thank you. And then Susanna did a, posted a little link about St. John's work and it's um, linked to help him with depression. But Currently, yeah. the evidence is still insufficient to draw conclusions. So it's a yeah. link on an NHS page. And Kate said, thanks for the talk, Terry. We used to attend THCP talks all the time when we lived nearby. Now we have moved away. So it's an, a nice silver lining of lockdown to be able to see this talk online and share it with my young children. Good. Good. Um, and then there's another link about St. John's work to do with Mind, Mind Charity. Mike and Caroline have said, thanks, Terry, lovely talk, and a good reminder of the THCP for those of us who haven't been able to visit lately. Um, Steve said, really fascinating talk, thank you. I'll miss these online events. They will come back. We've got plans for the autumn. Well, Terry's been talking to me about plans for topics for the autumn. 
<laughs> um, and uh, and Kate, my eight year old says she thinks we saw some knapweed in our local park earlier. You might well have done. You may well have done. It, well, it, it's in some parks. If if they leave a bit of grass uncut, I know in several parks where there is some in in uh, where where grass has been left uncut because it, it may have been surviving for years or even decades. Um, and then if it once gets its chance, up it goes. And uh, Rebecca's made a, another lovely comment. She says, I have really enjoyed this series of talks during this strange period. Book ended by Terry's walk in Stepney, looking at trees and this one. Much appreciated and I hope you all keep well. Long live the TH Cemetery Park. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Very lovely. Um, yes, so that's that. And that's really nice. That is really nice. Citronella said, thank you. That was an excellent talk. So I really enjoyed it. Um, from Scotland. Very, Did I see you from Scotland there? I don't, there might be someone no. from Scotland. I haven't got I that far that, done. The last one. I, thought, I, I haven't I got to the last it. one yet. I'm still don't worry, working, don't worry. working through all the thank yous. So Citronella said, thank you. That was an excellent talk. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I already said that one. Marie Claire said, thanks, Terry. So interesting as usual. John has said, thank you. Fascinating. Christopher, thanks so much, Terry. Fascinating as always. Oh, yeah. And then Michelle's posted a link to our YouTube playlist. And um, Dal K. I don't know where that's probably how you say it. Um, really great. I always learn learn a lot. Citronella mm. says, My 13 year old daughter really enjoyed your talk, Terry. Thank Good. you. That's great. Um, um, and then, well, that's a high, that's a high company. Yeah, a teenager. We, that's I mean, if it, it would only be higher if she, if she was 15, then yeah. it would be really high. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then uh, Helly yeah. said, Thank you so much. I've enjoyed these talks so much. We'll really miss them. Hope to see you all in person soon. Yes, there is someone from Scotland, Marion. Thank you, Terry. That's right. Yes, yeah, I, I saw that. I, I don't know whether it's a misspelling or some Scottish way of saying a word. Um, but anyway, something from Scotland. <laughs> I don't know what that was that meant to be. Um, and there we go. I think it's goodbye, Ken. I thought it might yeah, be goodbye, go. but it was the peas were throwing me. Yeah. <laughs> I was going for goodbye. I didn't, That's I didn't I don't pick know. that up. I didn't pick that up. Yeah. Oh, and, and Jackie said that she'd like some. When we're planning more talks, she'd like to see some on frogs and toads, I think. And uh, in great yeah. places for a great series. We, well, thank we you for all the lovely do. comments about our online talks and specifically Terry's one this evening. That's really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, that we could really probably do that. Is. That would be a, a, might be a good winter one, so people are ready for the frog sport. Yeah, and the that'd frogs, be nice. Yeah. yeah. Do it I before. managed to get a few photos of the frogs in spring in the scrapyard meadow pond, so at least we'll have something of our frog. yeah frogs toes frog. newts as well you can you can get them from elsewhere can't you yeah. we can't I'll, show our own if you can find toads in mylin park i found them in lots of found them in funny places well that's right and this is really this is really weird because we don't have them in the cemetery yeah. park yeah we just don't have them i have introduced toad spawn in the past but don't know what the problem is um yes so thanks for great and uh, can you do a mixture of online and talks in the park yes we do plan to reignite our, our actual in-person talks um there are things planned for autumn um through forage london so you have to visit forage london and beyond and book those and uh, we've got a few walks planned with groups but we do plan to reignite our kind of public series and start to do things we're doing walk we've got some group walk coming up for groups at the moment um, but yes we do want to restart our in-person walks because we've missed yeah. talking endlessly about the cemetery park in person. <laughs> but yeah. we've, to, we've been able to talk to lots of people who are in the cemetery park about the parks. We've had so many more visitors than normal. It's been so much busier. So we've had lots of kind of just getting stopped while you're wandering around, people asking questions. Um, anyway, there we go. And then uh, Jerry's told us, because we did the poisonous plants talk, and we got into a little bit of discussion about... Um, Deadly Nightshade, and she's uh, just given us a few places in the borough. She's seen it on Barnet Grove and the east side of North Quilter, of uh, North Quilter Street. So, um, right. That's, uh, so there we go. Because we were, because she, she told John Archer about a Deadly Nightshade in the borough, and he went and cut it down. I was like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> well, that people... but, it, but if you didn't destroy the root, we, it'd come back again. Exactly. Because it's exactly. a herbaceous plant. You can, you know, it dies down anyway in the winter. Yeah. And, uh, Citronella's asked if the park, cemetery park is open. Yes, very much so. It has been open throughout the whole 
of the pandemic. So we're open during daylight hours. So usually from about eight o'clock, eight in the morning till anywhere between seven and nine in the evening, the main gates are open, but you can still access outside of those areas. Outside of those the tiles, side gates, yeah. By the side gates on Hamlet's Way and Cantrell Road, they're permanently open. Uh, you can always come in. And, uh, lots of people will be getting Ingrid's telling us about Hemlock. I mean, Myland Park's covered in the stuff. Yeah, yeah. saying there's Hemlock in Mansford Street near Old Bethnal Green Road, um, by the Big yeah, Lewis Tower. Right. And, uh, and then <laughs> Jerry said she hasn't told John Archer about these new Deadly Night Shades because the, ber the berries look very luscious. So, um, <laughs> they, they are very luscious berries. When I was doing, when I was delving into poisonous plants, I read a story about an old woman who used to make pies from Deadly Night Shade berries thinking they were blackberries. And uh, she'd survive. The, 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 the ordeal every, every year she'd get sick and her family would worry about her and wonder what she was doing and then and she was actually seen picking the berries and people were like they're not blackberries they're not blackberries what are you picking? This kind of well, I did, I, I, I did read it? once I don't know whether it's correct but I read once that an adult may may need to eat 30 berries to be dead yeah. which is somewhat comforting yes if it it's is. true I don't know if yeah. it's true or not though yeah. I, um, I, I'm surprised it's that many yeah and then yeah. Dalkay said um, he ate one as a child and had to go to hospital and get his stomach pumped. Wow, we yeah, yeah. children, children yeah. don't really do that anymore. No, they don't really go so around don't, eating berries. <laughs> don't don't do it. But yeah. but um, everybody knows that it's the source of atropine, don't they? The that's used to dilate your pupils when they inspect your eyes. Mm. Yeah. But anyway, we've reached the end of the chat yeah. there. So unless anyone has anything they'd like to say in person. And we can turn our microphones off and give Terry a round of applause. So thank you, Terry. Terry. Very good. Thank you. Very good.